All right, this evening I'm going to be taking you through um, 2 Samuel chapter 17. Um, I preach through books of the Bible at my church, and so we've been preaching through, I've been preaching through um, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Um, and I need to catch up a little bit on where we're at in the story. Um, I won't catch up fully, but this is uh, during King David's reign as, as king of Israel. Um, but this is um, at a moment where his son, Absalom, has risen up against him um, and decided to try to take the throne. And David doesn't want to kill him, so David has fled um, from Jerusalem. And uh, Absalom came into Jerusalem and came into the palace, found it empty, was probably rather surprised to find it empty because he thought his father would put up a fight, um, but he hasn't. And all of this is happening um, because of David's sin, right? because of what David did, committing adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband Uriah uh, in order to cover it up. Um, all of this is God's punishment against David. They, God told David that he would, uh, that the, the sword would never leave his house, that there would be violence in his house, and that someone would come along and take his wives even, which Absalom did in the last chapter, in chapter 16. Absalom comes into Jerusalem, doesn't know quite what to do next. He asks his top advisor, Ahithophel, hey, what, what should I do? And he tells him, hey, you should sleep with your father's concubines. And we should set up a tent on the roof of the palace so everyone can see you taking them into that tent, in and out of that tent, all the concubines. Now, Ahithophel, you also need to know who he is, because Ahithophel is one of his counselors. He's got two counselors, Ahithophel and Hushai. Ahithophel is the counselor who first defected from David. It was David's top advisor and a brilliant man. But he was also Bathsheba's grandpa. And grandpa didn't forget what happened. This is many years after what David did with Bathsheba and Uriah, but grandpa didn't forget. And he bided his time. He waited. And he was going to pay David back for that when he had the opportunity. Sure enough, the opportunity came when Absalom told him, hey, I'm, I'm making a play for the throne. And he said, I'll come advise you. David is devastated by this. But, and he prays to God, God, please confuse the counsel of Ahithophel. Turn it to foolishness, because otherwise Absalom has got this in the bag. Sure enough, God sends along Hushai, who comes to David with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. He's in such mourning that David is leaving Jerusalem. And Hushai comes to him just devastated by the fact that, that he's leaving. And David says, no, actually, you can help me. Go back to Jerusalem and tell Absalom that you are on his side. And then you can give bad advice to rival Ahithophel's good advice. And so he gives Hushai this mission. And so that's where we pick up the story now. When they were, they're both in town. Absalom is looking for what's my next move. And he's going to ask his advisors what should he do next. Now that he's gotten to the palace, he's got the throne, he's slept with David's concubines. What's his next move? Chapter 17, verses 1 through 14. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic, and all the people who are with me will flee. I will strike down only the king, and I will bring all the people back to you as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Call Hushai, the archite, also, and let him, us hear what he has to say. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom said to him, Thus has Ahithophel spoken. Shall we do as he says? If not, you speak. Then Hushai said to Absalom, This is the time, this time, the counsel that Ahithophel has given is not good. Hushai said, you know that your father and his men are mighty men and they are enraged like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Besides, your father is an expert in war. He will not spend the night with the people. Behold, even now he has hidden himself in one of the pits or in some other place. And as soon as some of the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, there has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. 
Then even the valiant men, those whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will utterly melt with fear, for all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. But my counsel is that all Israel should be gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, as the sand by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in person. So we shall come upon him in some place where he is to be found, and we shall light upon him as he dew falls on the ground, and of him and all the men who are with him, not one will be left. If he withdraws to the city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we shall drag it into the valley until not even one pebble is to be found there. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The council of Hushai the archite is better than the council of Ahithophel. For Yahweh had ordained to defeat the good council of Ahithophel, so that Yahweh might bring harm upon Absalom. So Ahithophel's counsel. Ahithophel is the first step. He's the top advisor. What should we do, Ahithophel? Ahithophel suggests a surgical strike. Right? If you think about battle, this is a surgical strike. He says, we're going to go at night. We're going to go tonight while he's still on the road. We're going to get just David with a small group of guys. We're going to go and we're going to just get David. And we'll kill him and then all the other people will get to come back. And they can come and pledge themselves to Absalom, a surgical strike. That's what Ahithophel counsels. And everyone says, oh, that sounds pretty good, actually. That sounds like a secret agent type stuff, right? That's like, a, that's, that's, what, that's the drone strikes, right, that we got now. That's what he wants to do. A one-time, quick, hit him, get in, get out, clean. Because the whole goal is just to kill David. But Absalom says, well, let's hear what, let's hear what Hushai has to say. We got him. He's another advisor. He's another smart guy. Let's see if he agrees. And Hushai, now he's got to put on the performance of his life because he's got to give bad advice that sounds like good advice. And he's got to take this suggestion of Ahithophel and make it sound bad. And so he says, you know, normally I agree with Ahithophel. Normally he's a pretty smart guy, but this time, not so much. He's forgetting a few things. He forgets the fact that David and his men, they're mighty warriors. Because they are angry. They're like a bear, a mother bear robbed of her cubs. Now we all know, don't get between a mother bear and her cubs. And he says, that's what they're like. And David, he's smart. He's not going to stay with the people. He's not going to stay in the middle of it. He's going to go find a cave to hide in. He's going to go find a pit to hide in. He's going to hide away. You're going to hit them. They're going to fight back. And then they're all going to know that this has happened and you would have, will have failed. So then what, what he suggests is what you got to do, Absalom. you got to organize the whole army. Organize a whole new army. Get everybody, all of Israel, right? He says from Dan to Beersheba. And Dan to Beersheba was a way of saying all of Israel. It's, it's, uh, if we were to say it about our country, we say from sea to shining sea, right? The whole country. It says from Dan to Beersheba, sea to shining sea. Get everybody. We'll get this massive army and you can lead it, Absalom. You can go. Not just Ahithophel leading a small group of guys. You can lead the whole army just like your dad used to do. You can put on a big show. You get all the glory. Hushai wins. Why does Hushai win? Why does they listen to Hushai? Because he plays into Absalom's ego. Absalom gets the glory in this situation. The other situation, hey, David gets, get, just gets killed. Small group of people. Ahithophel gets the credit for leading them. But Absalom doesn't get any credit. All Absalom has to do is forgive all of the people that come back. Because he says, we'll get all the people come back. They'll be low body count. They can come back. You can forgive them. And that's not a lot of glory. There's not a lot of glory there. What Hushai says is, you get to lead the battle. You get to go and lead the whole new army. And we get to wipe them all out. We get to crush them. And we get to leave bodies all over the place. And you're going to get the glory. And so he listens to the counsel of Hushai. And then we're told at the end of that passage, I don't know if you, if you recognize this, caught this, but it says, For Yahweh had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel so that Yahweh might bring harm upon Absalom. We're told that this all happened. The reason that, that Hushai won is that God had ordained it. 
God had directed his will that this would happen. But here's the, here's the kicker. Hushai didn't know any of that. He still had to do it. Hushai had to do it. He had to go in as a secret agent, giving bad advice that sounds like good advice. Can you imagine? Try to do that about anything. Give, if your job was, hey, I want you to go give somebody bad advice that sounds like good advice, that's a pretty high, that's a pretty hard task to do. Because if he just comes in and gives bad advice, then I start going, now wait a minute, Hushai, are you really on our side? I think you might be a traitor. I think you might be a spy. You know, in fact, let's just kill you just in case. He's got to walk a very tight rope, right? He's got to watch a very th fine line there. And he does it. He has the courage to do what God has asked him to do. But he doesn't know that, that's, that God's will was going to be performed here no matter what. And so that's like us, right? We have also been called, just like Hushai, to take action. We've been called to step out and do what God has called us to do. Specifically for believers here and now, that's to spread the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Jesus commanded us in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is also a hard task. That is also a high calling, also sometimes a dangerous one. But one that we've been called to do. And knowing that God is in control and he will work it out. We'll continue here at verses 15 through 22. Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, Thus and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so have I counseled. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, Do not stay tonight at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Now Jonathan and Nahimaz were waiting at Enrogel. A female servant was to go with them, and they were to go and tell King David, for they were not to be seen entering the city. But a young man saw them and told Absalom. So both of them went away quickly and came to the house of a man at Bahurim, who had a well in his courtyard, and they went down into it. And the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and scattered grain on it, and nothing was known of it. When Absalom's servants came to the woman's house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? And the woman said, They have gone over the brook of water. And when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David. They said, they said to David, Arise and go quickly over the water, for thus and so as Ahithophel counseled against you. And David rose and all the people who were with him, and they crossed the Jordan by daybreak. Not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. All right, we got some new characters here. We got Zadok and Abiathar and Jonathan and Ahimaaz. Now, Zadok and Abiathar, they're priests. They're priests. Jonathan and Ahimaaz are their sons. So the, the priests are also undercover. They're also spies. They've agreed with David that they will shuttle him information. And so Hushai, working with them, is going to give them information. They're going to get it. To David and they've set up a system they tell uh, Hushai tells the priests the priests tell this servant girl and the servant girl tells their sons and then they can go take it to David but they get spotted they get caught they get caught and when they're spotted um, this young woman this servant woman she helps them hide there's a well on this guy's property and he's on their side and and they they go down and you think of the old style wells you know just a, a well like maybe this high but it goes down deep and it's in the courtyard there and they go okay get down inside of it they get down inside of it and this this servant woman she puts a, a blanket over the a covering over the well and then she takes some grain and scatters it on top of the blanket covering it and makes it look like that's not a well that's a little silo full of grain, right? That's not a well anymore. Now that's just full of grain. Don't worry about it. And so then they, get, they come looking for them and she says, oh, no, they, they left. They left. 
all of the people in this passage, right, the priests and their sons, they show tremendous courage. They tr tr display tremendous courage in this passage, right? Because espionage is not part of a priest's training, right? Even today, it's not part of pastor's training. We don't have, we don't have espionage as part of the seminary training, right? And certainly not the priests back then. But they showed this courage to get this information, vital information to David. They act outside of their comfort zone. But to me, the most impressive person in this passage is this unnamed female servant. Right? We don't even get to know her name. We don't know her name. We don't know who she is. But she had nothing to gain from this. Right? She had the least agency of anybody in this society. She's the lowest on the totem pole. A servant girl, she's the lowest on the totem pole. Nobody notices her. And her life isn't going to change depending on who is king. Right? It doesn't matter to her whether David's king or Absalom's king. She's still serving her master at this house. And nothing's going to change about that for her. She doesn't care who the king is. And yet she risks her life. She risks her life to step out and do this thing. Carried sensitive intelligence, critical to David's survival. She thought and acted quickly to successfully hide Jonathan and Ahimaaz. And she convincingly lied to save their lives. And what we see in this is that those who are unnoticed by society are known by God. Right? We don't know her name. Her name's not recorded. She's just a female servant. But God knows her name. God knows her name. And God can use, God sees, cares about, and can use anyone, regardless of how small they feel, regardless of how unnoticed they seem to be. We see this in Luke chapter 12, where Jesus himself says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and yet not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are more valued than many sparrows. God cares and sees every person, no matter whether they're noticed by society or not. We'll look lastly here at, at verses 23 through 29. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and went off home to his own city. He set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. Then David came to Mahanaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now Absalom had set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra, the Ishmaelite, who had married Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. When David came to Mahanaim, Shobi, the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the Ammonites, and Machir, the son of Amiel from Lodabar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogalim, brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans and lentils, honey and curds and sheep and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Okay, so we get a couple resolutions here on this story. First, Ahithophel. Ahithophel, the counselor, Bathsheba's grandpa. He was wise and he had good counsel. And he knew it. And he had such confidence that his counsel was the right counsel, that his ideas were the right ideas, that when he saw that he wasn't being listened to, when he saw that they weren't going to go with his advice, he went home, set everything in order, he made the bed, made sure his will was made out appropriately, and he hung himself. Imagine having that kind of confidence that you were right, <laughs> that he thought, that's what's going to happen anyway. But right? once we lose, David's going to kill me anyway. I might as well take care of it now. Right? He sees that he is um, on the wrong side. So Absalom and, and sets up his new army, and he crosses the Jordan. Amasa is the new commander of the army, and uh, he, there's a whole thing. <laughs> Let me read that little bit about he's this person's son who married this person, blah, 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 all that. I broke it down and figured it out. He's the first cousin once removed of the previous commander of the army. Okay, first cousin once removed of Joab. He's the previous commander of David's army. And that's, that's who Amasa is. He's the leader of the new army. 
And then we see that David, he gets set up in, in Mahanaim, this uh, city outside on the other side of the Jordan. It's his new base of operations. And he's got some supporters. That's the good news. We read that long list of supplies uh, that he's getting sent to him. And those are all being sent by these three guys. Three guys, Shobi, Makir, and Basilai. Those are his, these three supporters. And all of these guys have a tie to David. Shobi was the son of the Ammonite king that David had showed uh, kindness to. But the, the Ammonite king, the Ammonites are enemies of Israel, but they were in a time of peace and the, the Ammonite king died and David decided to show some kindness to them. He sent some people to go and, and kind of just pay them a visit, express his condolences, right? Essentially attend the funeral. But the new king, he thought, these guys are here to spy. They're here to, to do something underhanded to us. And so they, uh, he cuts off their garments, <laughs> like at the waist. <laughs> they cuts their, clo their cloaks in half, cuts them off so that they're naked from the waist down and sends them back. So <laughs> they have to march all the way back, miles and miles and miles, <laughs> uh, with no bottoms. Mm -hmm. They're humiliated. And so David goes to war with the Ammonites. And he wins. But then he kind of creates a new peace with them, with him being their, uh, their kind of his uh, vassal state, right? He, they're, they're in, he's in charge still. Now he, he is king over um, Ammon. And so this is the new king of the Ammonites, Shobi. And he doesn't want to make the same mistake that his brother made. So he knows, hey, David's in need. And we're going to supply him. And so they send things to him. They send him these, um, these goods. The second guy is Makir. Now, Makir um, is tied to a man named Mephibosheth. And I, I apologize all these names. I know it's, it's difficult. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, Saul's son. Jo Jonathan was David's best friend. Before David's king, they're best friends. Mephibosheth is his son. And when, when Saul and Jonathan died, um, his nurse picked him up and tried to flee with him because he was afraid, she was afraid that he would be killed uh, as a potential rival to the throne. And she dropped him on the way, and so he was crippled from his feet down. Um, he, he couldn't walk. And at some point, David, during his reign, once he gets fully established, he kind of asks, uh, hey, is there anybody that I can show kindness to from Saul's household? Anybody in Saul's household that I can show kindness to? And they say, actually, Mephibosheth is still alive. And David gets him and brings him and restores all of his grandfather's lands to him, shows him incredible kindness, asks him to come and eat at his table. And uh, everyone, everyone would have thought he would kill him, right? Everyone thought, oh, this is just an underhanded way to find him and kill him so that there's no rival to the throne. But David shows this incredible kindness. Makir is the guy whose house Mephibosheth was hiding in. And so he was, had a fr front row seat to David's kindness toward this guy. So now these guys are all giving him goods. Now, the Barzillai, he, he hasn't interacted with him before, but his, he's sure that supporting him will, will pay off in the end, and it does. So we can see two things here. David is in this situation. David is in this situation that he is in because as a direct result of his own actions, right? It's a consequence for his actions. The reason that his son has risen up against him, the reason there's all this violence in his household, the reason that his son even slept with his concubines, that is all punishment for what David did with Bathsheba. But David's ability to survive in this situation is also the direct result of his actions. Right? The fact that he has these men who will supply him, who will give him all of this food, is because of his past kindnesses, because of how good he has been to them. David is, both for good and for bad, reaping what he sowed. Right? He is experiencing the punishment uh, as a consequence of his actions from God. But he also is able to survive in this situation because of his past kindnesses. We will reap what we sow, both good and bad, as Galatians chapter six 
tells us, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will reap. For one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I'll wrap up with this, three takeaways for today's message. Number one, take action when God calls you. It takes courage, but we need to take action when God calls us, just like Hushai did, taking on a difficult task, not knowing whether God would help him, but he stepped out in faith and did what he had to do. Number two, know that you are valued by God and useful to God, regardless of how others see you or don't see you, as society often overlooks people. And then lastly, knowing that we'll reap what we sow, spend your time sowing to the Spirit. Spend your time doing good things, sowing it to the Spirit. I'm going to pray right now, and then we'll have a closing song. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for these stories that have so much meaning for us even today. Such an old, old story, God, but such relevant, vibrant truth that can inform how we live here and now. So God, I thank you for this time that we can spend in your word. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.